Welcome to Packaging Experts Tell All. This is a show that takes place the third Tuesday of each month. The purpose of our show is to provide stories, examples, and tips that help you buy packaging better. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder. I'm a growth strategist and help B2B tech companies with their marketing. I oversee marketing for Real Sourcing Network. We go by RSN for short. RSM provides an innovative and painless way for companies to buy high quality print and packaging for less. We help companies design, re-engineer and source packaging. We focus on helping companies make their packaging more sustainable. Our panelists have spent years in the packaging industry as buyers, consultants and manufacturers. Each show we pick a different packaging related topic. Today, we are talking about flexible packaging. So to kick off the discussion today, I'm going to have each panelist share a favorite flexible packaging story. For those of you that are joining us from around the globe, please put in the chat function where you are joining us from. And if you have something that you've experienced in regards to flexible packaging in your career, feel free to pop that in the comments as well. This is also very interactive. So if you have questions that come up throughout the discussion today, please, please feel free to put those in the comments and we'll make sure that we get to those as well. So I am going to have James uh, kick us off today. So James, if you could introduce yourself, um, if you have a brand that you think is doing some really innovative things and in flexible packaging, would love to share what that is. And then if you have a favorite flexible packaging story to share with us. Okay. Hi, James Jones, um, 20 plus years in the packaging space, um, president of JKT Packaging Solutions. Um, we do um, a lot of things packaging related, uh, sourcing, design, um, brokering is probably our biggest, uh, is probably our biggest money maker uh, where we, uh, we provide packaging to clients that may or may not have the buying power to buy from the big guys, but they utilize our buying power and, and in that we're able to source, design, broker, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know about a favorite packaging, but the, the, the my favorite packaging story is what's going on now in the industry and um, the push, the the need, the everybody clamoring at my door for sustainable packaging, um, just sustainable everything, and like uh, be you know sustainable, compostable at the very least, um, and we can get into it later. Um, at the very least, residentially recyclable. People don't really know there's a difference between commercially recyclable and residentially recyclable. Um, so just I, it's it's almost like when I meet when we talk to a new client, I can almost tell them what they're going to tell me. You want sustainable packaging. <laughs> you want it. You want it there, and you want it for a certain cost. So um, my favorite story is what's going on right now and what happened this morning on the phone. So. Awesome, James. Well, pleasure to have you with us and looking forward to hearing some of the examples and stories you have to share with us today. Next up, we have Terry. Terry, great to have you with us on our show. We'd love to have you introduce yourself. If there's a brand that stands out to you that's doing some really cool things in flexible packaging, we'd love to hear who that is. And then if you have a favorite flexible packaging story. And Terry, you're muted, so you want to unmute. There you go. Hate when that happens. Um, thank you. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the call. Uh, I'm Terry Baker, I, I work for Fresco System USA uh, as their vice president of marketing and sales. And uh, I had to do some math to confirm how long I've been in the industry. It'll be 38 years uh, next month and have enjoyed every, all of it. Uh, I don't have a, a favorite brand per se. I think of my favorite product category within the industry and that's, a, I'm going to say a pouch, particularly a stand up a pouch uh, in retail food and liquid food because it is still the fastest growing category within the segment. Uh, you know, it transformed the baby food aisle uh, and we, we were a part of that as well. 
far as my favorite story, uh, it's really one of a, a development project that we've worked on for close to 10 years, and that was to replace the number 10 can that is used in food service uh, with a pouch uh, and, and for retort applications. And, and that pouch was made on a, on a, on a vertical form fill and seal system. Um, ultrasonic sealing was developed in order to seal through particulates in the product and uh, it's doing very well and it's continuing to grow uh, gradually within food service. Obviously it got slowed down just last year due to COVID. So those are my stories. Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us, Terry. Next up, we have Tim. Tim, if you could introduce yourself, if you have a brand that stands out in your mind that's really doing a, a good job using flexible packaging, would love to hear what that brand is. And then a favorite flexible packaging story. Okay, uh, Tim Majors, president of AccuFlex Packaging, a brand new startup. We've been uh, selling commercially now, commercially now for about 12 months but uh, I've had 34 years of traditional wide web flexible packaging uh, experience with a number of companies. So uh, that's my introduction. I'd like to take a quick history of a packaging of a product that I think has evolved over the years. And today to me exemplifies the um, innovative use of flexible packaging. And what I'm talking about is the peanut butter. Uh, back in the day that maybe only Terry and I can remember, uh, peanut butter used to come in glass jars. And the uh, company was J.M. Schmucker uh, and their GIF brand. And eventually, uh, those glass jars were always a challenge, particularly when I worked at the uh, supermarket early in my career. Uh, when I heard clean up in aisle three, uh, this often happened, or you happen to drop that glass jar on your hardwood floor at home. But eventually, they moved away from glass jars to the high-density replacement, which doesn't break. <laughs> it can crack, but it really doesn't break. So. That was a great improvement. Uh, and then they continued to evolve and they moved into, with the help of a very good flexible packaging company in the upper Midwest, they moved into a pouch with a nice cap on the bottom. And that's how it stands up and is sold. And you see a lot of condiments that way today. Sorry, I'm trying to get the camera right. You see a lot of condiments sold today, uh, mayonnaise, ketchup. And um, and again, I it it hasn't stopped there because now what I see out there is more innovation in a pouch with something that is shaped and it's got a nice cap on it for easy dispensing, as well as instructions on the back. If you want to use the whole thing, cut it off and pour it out. So again, a lot of innovation there. Uh, all of these packages that I just talked about, whether it's glass, the high density uh, containers, or the flexible pouch, to me, present their own uh, recycling challenges, okay? And I believe it's, it's really all segments of the packaging market today must be taking whatever steps we can to right size, downsize, and explore materials that really, uh, accomplish the most important task in all these products, and that is the product integrity and keeping the consumer safe. So that's just my little spiel about what we can all do differently or better uh, in the packaging arena. Uh, favorite flex pack story, and I'll try to make it quick, Sarah. I know I talk too much sometimes. Uh, oftentimes people think of flexible packaging as strictly food packaging, and probably 70%, I believe, the number of uh, is today a flexible packing, it, packaging does go into the food uh, food arena. But uh, I'm going to talk about a non-food application, a lesson I learned early in my career in this. And this was uh, years ago, I was working for a business that uh, was supplying printed, highly extensible film to a diaper manufacturers. And the diaper manufacturers would compress these diapers and then put them into this uh, polyethylene bag for retail sale, uh, along with the cartons that were on the shelf. Uh, well, one of the major brands that I was not supplying the, uh, the national brands, the two big CPC national brands, I was supplying 100% of my business was going into the private label uh, uh, suppliers into the market. 
Well, one of those large uh, national uh, retail stores had a new marketing or brand manager. He had a great idea. He walked down the, uh, the aisle and all what he saw was white bags or white cartons with babies' pictures on them. So his idea was he was going to look different on the store shelf. So he came out uh, with a certain segment of his diaper product that they went to market with that I made the bags. And it was a black diaper bag with stars all over it. So just, just think of a diaper bag that was sort of like this in terms of the uh, black look with stars all over it. Well, what I learned from that experience and the results proved to me what I still believe today, that packaging can sell your product. Now, at the end, your product's got to be good to begin with, but if the package is different, unique, or out of the ordinary, and somebody picks it up and want to try it, you'll get, the re, you'll get the resale time and again as long as your product is good. But the package makes that first uh, impression. And the moral of this story was, it was a very bad impression. Nobody wanted black diaper bags at the market. It did not last very long. And it was quickly shelved away with, I think, the Coke reformulation of many years ago. So that's my story. Tim, I was going to say, where's, where's our sample? Where's our picture or sample of the diaper bag? That was so long ago. I think it's degraded. It's been biodegraded. I don't know. It's gone. It's long gone. That was a long time ago. It's in the warehouse with clear Pepsi somewhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Awesome, Tim. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Looking forward to uh, some, of, some of the wisdom you have to share with us. Mark, you are up next. Would love to have you introduce yourself and tell us a, uh, a favorite flexible packaging story. Sure. First off, good to see you again, Sarah. Tim, always a pleasure to, to share a conference stage virtually with you. Lots of knowledge. James, good to see you again. And, and Terry and Dustin, nice to meet you for the, hopefully for the first time, but not the last. Uh, my background real quick is 28 plus years now in corporate procurement. The last 12 have been focused on packaging. Um, I got into packaging because as a procurement person, I realized that the people who produce the packaging and the people who sell the packaging, frankly, understand it a lot better than the people who buy the packaging. And as a procurement person, anytime you find that level of imbalance, it, it makes me uncomfortable. So I really started to focus on how can we, we make better procurement decisions and uh, it, from a packaging perspective, and that's what my company and I work on. Um, I, I have a slightly different you know, opinion about uh, films and others and then the people who produce it. I'm looking at more from a customer standpoint and looking at more from a procurement standpoint. What, what I really like and, and where I think plastics kind of get a bad you know, moniker in the, in the market today is with plastics, you're able to make so many improvements in the shelf life of foods and products that really when we think about waste and deterioration and, and what can we do, let's focus, and I think the industry's done a great job on this, um, on making the products last longer. So I have a great story for you. So I, I have had in my, his, his, in my history of my career the opportunity and privilege to work with many great food brands. And I, I can't share all of them, but I worked with a, a berry company, a well, very well-known berry company. And I also work with a company in California that's uh, referenceable, but we use uh, they, they use um, well-known bag salad and fresh cut veg company. Um, <clears throat> and the innovators and the executives at this fresh cut veg company really created a, a, a very unique way to approach something called modified atmosphere packaging. They created a membrane both with chemical uh, and mechanical properties that allow the food package or whatever the product is to, to get live in its optimal environment and thus extend the shelf life. And I've had a very a great privilege to, to work with both of these companies, a berry company and the company that invented this technology. And we worked on a way to, to create a pallet size bag to fit over an entire pallet of berries uh, and then use a machine to, to in, introduce uh, particular uh, gases, carbon dioxide, to create an optimal environmental uh, environment, rather, for the berries to travel. And I helped design and source that bag for the company. So uh, it, was a, it was a great success. It was able to prove mathematically and scientifically that they were able to extend the shelf life on average of five to six days from bringing berries across the country. So I'm a big believer in the power of what of what flexible packaging can do. And obviously, you know, these folks are far more, have far more expertise in it, but uh, that's what I really am excited about. It's using pl plastics and, and films to do more with the product and protect it 
and improve its shelf life. And that's where I think that market's really going to be focused in the next few years. And Mark, I think that would be a great case study to talk about how the example that you just provided, how packaging actually significantly increased revenue for the company. So packaging not only sells your products, but it can actually increase revenue. If you're able to extend the shelf life of your product. Yeah. And if you think about how that happens, not only can you charge the berry company or any company more for a premium package that extends the shelf life, but you as the producer, then as the grower, you, you also reduce chargebacks because the product arrives in better condition, arrives safer and it arrives fresher. So I, I think, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of great minds like Tim in this industry, obviously, Terry, uh, I'm sure Dustin. And, and so our, our focus as a, as a company is really finding ways to apply the packaging to, to do the most good and, and have the most benefit for companies. That's how I approach it. Awesome. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Always a pleasure. Dustin, we'd love to have you introduce yourself and share a favorite flexible packaging story. Sure. So my name is Dustin Stearman. I'm a regional vice president of sales with EPAC Flexible Packaging. Primary focus is in market and product development here in North America. Um, for those that don't know who we are, um, EPAC started in 2016 as an all digital based flexible packaging converter and manufacturer with a heavy emphasis and focus on providing small brands with big brand presence. Since introducing the model, we've expanded our footprint to 16 plants in North America and we're presently operating in eight different countries and more that we'll be sharing later this year. Um, from the standpoint of a, a favorite story, before I get there, I, just, I guess I'll take a step backwards. Um, 15 years in the paper packaging plastics industry, only about four and a half on the plastic side. And what I'll share with those is that coming from the paper side of the business, we had a really well-established infrastructure for waste and repurposing of materials. It was a major eye-opener for me when I stepped into the plastic side of packaging and realized the lack of infrastructure. So since making that move, I've been on really a, a mission with our organization of how can, how can we be collaborative and accretive towards a more sustainable and circular economy. Um, from a story perspective, I would say for, for me, um, it really it revolves around the entrepreneurs in CPG today and seeing the difference that they're making when it comes to innovation and bringing new offerings to market that in essence are taking away from large CPG's market share. For us at EPAC, it's a really fulfilling experience when you get to work with a brand who's launching a product and be able to be part of their growth. One of the things that we know within packaging is that it oftentimes is a showstopper of being able to take on a new opportunity, a new retailer, right? Um, when you look at the traditional lead times, it stops you in your tracks at times from being able to say yes. So for us, being able to be a partner with with many, many brands, not just here in North America, but now globally and be able to support their growth is is really um, where we where we get to have fun. And I think that every entrepreneur's story that we get to hear about how they got started, their why and what drives their business is, is really um, a moment that we get to enjoy. And there's not one single story that that stands out above the others. Um, aside from that, I would say sustainability for us today. And I'll just quickly share um, one story, which is you know, we're heavily focused on child resistant manufacturing, child resistant flexible packaging. It took us two years to bring to market our first product. And I'm excited to be able to say it took us three months to, to do the next. And I attribute that to the team that we've built here over the last two years and really you know, having a lot of great minds and great supply chain working together towards innovation which is where we're heavily focused today. And lastly, I um, just want to comment, Mark, love that story you shared. Um, I think if you look at like a step forward with what consumers are looking for today, maybe seeing that pallet go in bulk and enter a store where you can actually pick those strawberries off and they're not even transporting in a package isn't too far off in the future. And Dustin, I love that you mentioned circular economy. It's something that I'm really starting to hear a lot in procurement and supply chain. And I think it's becoming a priority. And I think the pandemic actually helped. And people are realizing how much waste packaging is generating and wanting to do what they can to minimize and really try to recycle and reuse as much as possible. So I'm glad that you uh, you brought that up. So 
Now we're going to kick off our q and I also want to, again, open it up to the audience. Any questions that you have about flexible packaging, feel free to put those in the comments. I want to make sure we get to any specific questions that you have. But I'm going to have James start off the conversation. And I want to just start really basic and simple with describing what is flexible packaging. And one of the things I, I get asked a lot is people don't know when they should use flexible packaging versus other types of packaging. So if you could shed some light on that as well. Um, without oversimplifying it, flexible packaging is any packaging that's not rigid, basically. Um, so um, anything to deal with, uh, bags um, in the sense of either multi-wall paper bags or uh, poly bags, bulk sacks, anything like that. Um, where you'd want to use them, um, where we found um, they get really used is liquids are first of all. Um, anything liquid, anything that would um, that would cause spill. Obviously, we know the the whole history of water and paper. So corrugated for liquid is not not really a sustainable solution. Um, and what we've also found is um, any kind of powder or any kind of package that that is moving. And um, so a powder like um, diametaceous earth. We've worked with uh, clients that that mine and mine diametaceous earth. That's more lent to flexible packaging. Um, any kind of dairy products um, now is, is even as Tim showed. Um, I wouldn't call peanut butter liquid, but it, it can behave like one if it gets hot enough. Um, and also, um, also what the other interesting um, application we found is in the farming uh, community. So with living soil, uh, living soil can't be put in boxes, and, and living soil is not dirt. It's it's a whole bunch of other stuff um, that can um, that needs to breathe that can deteriorate, that's organic. Um, anything like that is probably gonna lend itself more to flexible packaging as opposed to any kind of rigid packaging, which would be a box, a crate, or anything like that. Uh, boxes and crates probably need to, uh, are better suited for assembled products, um, products that are solid, uh, that kind of thing. Also, the better, the thing you get with flexible packaging that you don't necessarily get with rigid is being able to ship. Um, rigid packaging um, has a cube has it has it has a cube limit. Um, cubing out a truck with rigid packaging, what you find is a lot of time is you're shipping a lot of air because that rigid packaging has to take up a lot of it has to take up different spaces on it. Um, pallets have to get stocked. Um, it has you have to have some sort of strength barriers, which means sharp corners, and which means the package in its in its in its nature is going to be bigger than than what you're putting into it. Whereas not so much with flexible packaging. If I put dirt, if I put liquid, if I put rocks or, or gravel, um, what tends to happen is the, 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 the amount of air, the amount of space between the actual product and the packaging can be very limited as opposed to with, with any kind of rigid packaging. Awesome, James, thanks for that. So we've got a, a lot of questions already coming in from the audience. So we're gonna jump around a bit and I wanna make sure that, that we address all of these questions. So Mark, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this question over your way. The question is, what's the top priority this year to help cut costs down on packaging? Like most things, we're seeing significant increases in the price of raw materials, shortages. So what can companies do to actually keep the cost down or potentially even um, reduce costs by using flexible packaging? Watch the screen below because uh, Rob just sent a message and I was just putting my head down to reply. So it's going to be really simple because I did ah, look at that. Isn't that amazing how the timing works on this? It just here, here's where we see going on right now. I mean, in our in our general logic, and again, I approach this from the buy side. When you have an increase and a significant increase in raw materials due to just general market conditions, most of which are out of people's control. I mean, we, the polyethylene markets were killed due to weather, due to freezing, due to global geopolitical issues, freight. We can't control that. So we get asked a lot and we were brought in very, very frequently now to look at in this market, what can we do? And our, our philosophy is real simple. And I think, and I can't remember, it might've been Terry or Tim or maybe Dustin who mentioned it earlier. What we see more more commonly is people are overspecking their packaging, okay? And we think there's a lot of size, dimensional waste, and we think there's a lot of material waste. 
And so what, what we focus on right now and what I think the most prudent approach in this market is get people who understand technical design. And I'm not, I'm not by far the expert on my team. We have uh, we recently added a PhD polymer chemist who is the expert, but we, we look for ways to use less material to design and engineer the package better. A lot of times packaging is an afterthought. Like they just say, oh, let's just build it this way. And really not enough thought goes into it. So in, in the world of corrugated, in the world of film right now, if you can cut out 10% of the raw material, 11, 12% of the raw material on a package, that's where you're gonna get your next level saving from. Because right now it's not on price. And uh, given the way these, these prices are in the market, you know, you're lucky, you're lucky to get any kind of reduction from suppliers. So you have to drive it with, with just using less material. And it's not always easy, but really sharp people with really good technical capabilities can drive savings from value engineering and design. So Dustin, question for you. Uh, Corey asked, any progress being made in reusable, flexible packaging? And I know we have a few other questions as well that have come in about sustainability and biodegradable flexible pouches. So what are your, what have you seen uh, in this space? Anything positive um, that's being tested or actually being used today? So, so I would say that if you're looking at it on the individual package itself and the ability to open it and then make use of it again as the consumer, very limited today. I believe we're starting to see a little bit of that potentially with poly mailers. Um, in, in food packaging, where I'd see more of the reuse taking place is going to be collection of that packaging, call it in-store drop-off is a great example. Um, Trex Decking is you know, one of the largest procurers of that in-store drop-off, and they recently shared that their consumption is up to 450 million pounds annually, up from 300 million in 2017 or 2018. So what we're seeing happen today is we're seeing more um, outputs being created for repurposing in essence. We're seeing post-consumer recycles are really gaining a lot of traction in the market today, specifically food um, approved direct food contact PCRs. Um, and a lot of what feeds that is going to be collection of high density polyethylene, you know, mono materials like milk jugs. So I, I, I to answer that question, I would say we're seeing more circularity through repurposing of materials than we are a reusability of a package. Um, really minimal amount of reusability of package today. Okay. Terry, next question for you from Autumn. How close are we to biodegradable flexible pouches for hot fill beverages or a more sustainable option? Sure. <clears throat> Um, well, our, our company you know, individually, you know, we're, we're working primarily on, I'll say, recyclable materials, similar to uh, what was mentioned previously uh, for mono materials that can be thrown into a certain bin that's already has the collection and uh, recycling infrastructure structure in place. Uh, we have also developed uh, biodegradable materials um, as well as uh, compostable. Now, with respect to liquid, our focus is also on the recyclable structure. In fact, we've developed laminations that, that can meet those requirements uh, for liquid foods and certainly could be done with beverages as well. And, and one of those areas, again, is, is baby food, which in this particular application is a hot fill. So it's developmental. Uh, but we've, we've done the work to validate its, its fitness for use. And, and the primary uh, work was around the, uh, the pouch making and getting the, the fitment, if there is a fitment, in the film to be compatible, be it polypropylene or polyethylene, and certainly more of a challenge with polyethylene on a uh, when you're doing fitment insertion. All right, Terry, thank you for that. Tim, uh, next question I'm going to throw over to you is also from Autumn. 
Do you find consumers are resistant to flexible pouches in North America for beverages outside the baby food market due to the big anti-plastic marketing that we've seen? And I, I, I think this is definitely on the rise. I know a lot of people we talk to think plastic is bad and they want nothing to do with plastic. Can you unmute me, Sarah? <laughs> Autumn's blocking my button. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I do believe there is a lot of, there, there is a big anti-plastic marketing effort out there. And as we've talked in previous sessions and even today, I mean, there's a lot of uh, good that plastics and flexible packaging can and does bring to the market. Uh, and there's a lot of uses today uh, in, in the beverage arena, but Again, there's a lot of pushback because of the bad rap we have gotten. And again, I think as we develop uh, with the local municipalities, the infrastructure to, like, to collect and properly recycle the plastics, uh, long term, I think that's, that's really the solution. Uh, we've just got to work collectively together to build this infrastructure that's going to take all this packaging. And, and again, to Mark's point earlier, we do over-engineer almost every package you see out there in, uh, in a lot of cases, and there's a lot can be done that, in that arena as, as we get to the point where we collect everything and properly recycle it. Could, could, I, could I jump in on that and, and build off something Tim was saying on this particular issue, Sarah? Absolutely. Please do. So, so th this area is fascinating because I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm not pro, anti, pro or anti-plastic. I'm pro-packaging and pro-quality product, right? So, but, but there's a trade-off here. And, and what we're seeing, this is fascinating. For example, we, we have a lot of clients that are clamoring for like PCR, post-consumer uh, mm -hmm. uh, PET bottles. And then what happens is you get a big company like Coca-Cola who wants to play in this space and makes a big push to say, all right, well, we want to do it. Coca-Cola is so big that when they start saying, we want, PC, we want PCR, we want recycled PET, and then all of a sudden there's not enough. OK, and they're controlling this market. We're talking about companies all over the world don't have the physical capacity and the process to create enough recycled PET. So what we see is sort of this weird inverse situation where actually virgin PET for a bottle. I mean, we're working with a customer that's paying 32 percent more for a recycled PET bottle than they would for a virgin PET bottle. So at some point, the marketing benefit to them, at least using using just free market, they believe that the marketing benefit is worth 32% more to, to pay for a recycled bottle. What we see in the short term is, however, that that 32% probably by next year is going to be 52% premium because it's just going the wrong direction. And so to Tim's point, it's going to take a concerted effort and I'm, you know, geopolitical government uh, business to create more infrastructure and more ability to recycle. It's very capital intensive. And mm -hmm. it's We'll get serious about putting the money in for this and make it a priority it's just going to create demand and supply imbalances in the marketplace which isn't really going to help anybody because the little guy is going to get squeezed out in price so that that's what i see going on it's kind of a, a, a challenging situation for smaller companies getting in who want to use recycled materials james your thoughts yeah so i, I think in another trend um it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio but the more expensive the product is that's going into the package, the more people are willing to look at sustainable, the more people are willing to, to, to care about that kind of thing. When you're putting something in that costs pennies, um, yeah, it would be nice if it were sustainable, if it were recyclable, it would be all that. But those, those clients don't tend to care as much. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And what I, what I try and tell suppliers and everything is you got to remember your customer is the buyer. The end customer, I'm buying a product. I'm not buying the bag. I'm not buying the box. I'm not buying any. I'm buying the product. I'm, I'm more interested about the product inside. Everything else is ancillary. So, if you're gonna if you're gonna put a marketing 
um, a campaign or anything toward it. That just know who the person buying, it's the buyer. It's not necessarily the end customer. So to the buyer, it's a box, it's a bag, it's a, it's, it's a commodity, it's, it's, that's what it is. So we've got to change how we focus and who we focus um, that marketing on. Because if you're focusing it on me, the guy that's going to buy a Coke, a can, of, a bottle of Coke, yeah, it's great. It's recycled. But you know what? I bought the bottle of Coke before it was recycled. You know, it may make me feel a little better, but somehow you got to make the buyer who is the one that, that really has to, to, to make these decisions. That's where, that's where our focus needs to go toward. I think we've, we focus on the general public a lot and the general public's important but they're not making this they're not making the decision on the package to buy yeah and and james along those lines you know gucci just rolled out a sustainable packaging program so i i think the they're trying to leverage the unboxing experience for a consumer like myself who's maybe very into fashion right so i think it also depends on the industry if I'm buying a Coke bottle, my unboxing experience is probably not as important if I'm buying a $5,000 bag. Or you look at Apple. I think a big part of buying a, a, a MacBook Pro or an iPhone is the unpackaging experience. So I think it's also industry specific. Sure. do I have time to add a couple of comments? Absolutely, please do. I don't know if, if Autumn's question was solely about uh, recycling or um, sustainability, but we do a lot of uh, a liquid packaging and a couple of things. One, the growth today, there's tremendous growth in single serve and in particular carbonated beverages and hard seltzer. So one, today we, we don't have a solution to that for flexible packaging to stand up to that pressure, which can certainly change under environmental conditions. Uh, to, to James' point, you know, we're finding interest in the spirits and ready to drink category for multi-serve formats, um, because number one, the price point certainly allows for that. Uh, there's interest from a marketing perspective to stand out from what we call the wall of same. Uh, and it's a it's a very viable package for e-commerce. It's it's not breakable, it's lighter weight. So there's there are a lot of benefits when it comes to sustainability. And and there is that anti-plastic marketing. People have that stigma. I think it's up to us in the industry to, you know, better educate our customers and consumers because if you look at the the economic or not the economic data but the the data around energy use and, and greenhouse gas emission uh, you can't find a better package than flexibles versus glass or, or metal rigid containers thank you yeah, thanks, Terry. And Dustin, I wanted to circle back to you quickly before we move on to our next topic um, about Mark's comment about Coke's demand for PCR bottles. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just wanted to add, I think it's a, it's a really important um, point that Mark made around Coke's transition. And the, the, the reason I say that is I'm not into, I don't have intimate relationships with with Murphs. I don't know enough about that space. I actually need to spend a little bit more time plan to do it last year. Didn't get to long story short is we do need that type of large volume demand for a recovery facility to go out and invest the capital to collect the material to the, so that they can justify an ROI in order to be able to create that circularity. But as Mark said, it creates a complete disruption to all the other brands that are in the market may have been first to market with that demand. Um, so it's, it's constantly this balancing game of, you know, supply and demand in essence. And I think, you know, we're going to see that for a while in packaging, especially in formats where the current infrastructure doesn't exist today, but we need those moves. We do need those moves in order to help support um, forward looking investment. Thank you, Dustin. So Tim, um, one of the, the things that I know you do a lot of work in the cannabis space, it's a, it's a booming industry here in California, it's a really big market. And I know flexible packaging is a really important 
type of packaging for the cannabis industry. So I'd like you to touch on how companies in the cannabis space are using flexible packaging and, and maybe some of the challenges and things that you have experienced as you're working with customers in that industry. Uh, I think Dustin will support me on this, but it is a challenging uh, market. Uh, it is a very fragmented market because the states where cannabis has been legalized, whether recreational or medicinal, um, each state has their own rules and regulations. We find some of the larger states, like where you are, Sarah, almost uh, by county, there are different rules and regulations. So as a supplier of flexible packaging into all these uh, different markets and different rules and regulations, it's, it's always a challenge, but it, again, I'm supplying the packaging and my challenge has been to uh, properly supply a package with the child resistant zipper, which I think we've talked about in earlier sessions. And uh, uh, it's just, sorry, my lights go out if I don't move in here. Uh, it, a lot of it's educational. A, a lot of these companies are new and just startups. Uh, I think to James point earlier, there's a high price point on the product which means they're willing to pay whatever they have to pay to get a good package and a package that works. And, uh, but their understanding of really flexible packaging is, um, is at a very elementary level. So it's a lot of education with each of these brands that I've, that I've dealt with over the short time we've been involved in it. Uh, Dustin, I know you do a lot in the cannabis space as well. Anything else you'd like to add that you've seen some major challenges or maybe some wins too, where you've seen flexible packaging really help a startup build their brand. Sure, um, echo Tim's statements in, from the standpoint of there's, a, a, I think with any category right now, small, medium sized businesses and CPG need education. That's where companies like Acuflex, companies like EPAC really can differentiate themselves and we do differentiate ourselves operating digital technology. But I also would say that when you look at cannabis, it falls into the platform that Acuflex Repack has built uh, very well. Um, as Tim said, highly fragmented market. You could have a brand that operates in 10 states, but every one of those SKUs that they have, even if it's strawberry, um, is 10 different SKUs because of the state regulations, which is why it leans towards a digital environment in addition to the actual package footprint itself. Uh, wins for flexible packaging? I would say that when we entered the space four years ago and we built in Boulder, Colorado, um, there really was not a retail sized pouch with the press to close technology. It didn't exist in the market at that time. What we saw at the time was slider closures, very similar to the Tide Pod pouches that are in market today. And they, that, that track does not work on a four inch wide pouch. What has happened, and I see it as a major win for flexible packaging, is technology and innovation in the closures has come to market. Flexible packaging is being um, elevated by the brands in terms of a packaging format that they're willing to put their products into. Initially, brands would look at it as if it was a low, low cost packaging option. It wasn't. It didn't deliver on their vision of premium product. And I would say that that view has, has actually left the market thanks to several brands that have decided that flexible packaging was going to be a better route, more sustainable um, and cost wise aligned to, to their goals. So what we're seeing happen is rigid plastics are leaving the market and we're seeing more demand going towards the flexible packaging that now can provide a similar child resistant closure, resealable capabilities as a popped up bottle will provide. I see that as a major one. So okay. Dustin, to kind of counter that, Autumn said they're actually having a lot of consumer pushback um, for using flexible packaging of a premium beverage product. Their consumers are thinking that plastic is bad and it doesn't come across as premium. So her company is definitely experiencing some branding challenges with the flexible packaging. Yeah, and I would say to that, you know, it, it goes back to Tim's point. It, this is this is very much leaning on the need for education. Consumers know what they know based on the information that's available to them. Um, we as manufacturers, we need to put more emphasis on the availability of life cycle assessments so that consumers understand 
the difference in going to a flexible package versus a rigid container and have a holistic view of the actual impact of that package. Um, look, you know, my, my wife, she'll ask me constantly throughout the week, is this recyclable? Is this not recyclable? And half the time I have an answer. The other half the time I have to go check and, and we're in the industry, right? So I think a lot of that is consumer perception, unfortunately. And um, that's where we as an industry need to work together to help really provide the information needed for consumers. So thanks, uh, Dustin, for that. So we've got about 15 minutes left and I wanna make sure we cover the topic of sourcing flexible packaging. Some of our audience is actually in procurement and so they're the ones actually doing the buying at their companies. So, so James, I, I wanna ask you, what advice do you have for people sourcing flexible packaging? Where should they start? What should they look out for? I know you, you and the team have a lot of experience with actually sourcing this and it can be really overwhelming and challenging for brands who don't have a lot of flexible ex packaging experience. So the first thing um, we we typically we take a, a scientific approach to it. First thing is understand what's going into the packaging. Um, do you really need flexible packaging? Do you want it? What is your reason for wanting flexible packaging? Most times, I'm sorry to say, it's cost. Um, it's just it's price. It's price versus um, versus anything else. I mean, we try and say we put all these other factors in. And as I was just on a call yesterday, and I said, don't ever undersell price as, as they may not mention it they may not say it but price is always there and and the reason a lot of companies go to flexible is because of price honestly um you can get if you're as opposed to a box a, a little box mailer or something like that or anything paper related you go to flexible because of price now when you get into your branding how much do i want printed on it that kind of thing you're going to diff then that's when you you, all these branches start going out. Um, my first advice is call Tim. Um, Tim's gonna Tim's the man. So, but but if you um, but the key thing is understand what's gonna go into it. Um, how many different SKUs are you gonna have? Um, and to Dustin and, and, and Tim's Tim's point, um, if you're going into something like packaging, you need to understand, even if it's the same thing, all state regulations are going to be different. County regulations may be different. Maybe you want to look at it. Maybe you want to look at labels as opposed to direct printing. You need to understand that kind of thing. If you're going to if you're going to have a lot of different SKUs, understand all the things that are out that are that are that are there for you. If you want to stay in the U.S. Um, I'm sorry to tell you, but be prepared to, to be prepared to understand that manufacturing in America versus manufacturing anywhere else, the price is going to be different. That doesn't mean that manufacturing in the U.S. is not a viable solution for you or isn't something you shouldn't do. It just you need to understand that the price is going to be different. There's a reason people go to Mexico or China for what they need. Um, understand that. Understand um, where you want to be in a year. Does this need to be scalable? And then if you know you're going to grow, then you may want to look at, at these bigger at these bigger places offsite or offshore. But understanding where you are and what you want to put in the package is where I would start. Then if you do that, then you could go then you can start looking at and educate, educate yourself and you can look at other other at other options. Um, but if you don't if you just think, OK, I want to go cheap, I want to put this in a flexible package and that's going to be the end all and it's going to be great for me, then, as Dustin said, you need some more education. Um, you're going to need to understand you're, you're going to need to you're going to need to you're going to need to look at at certain things because it's not going to be as easy. Maybe your customer base pushes back on you because it's plastic and plastic's bad, you know, those kind of things. So start in the U.S. Um, it, design capabilities in the U.S., I, I will say this to you, are, are much are higher superior. Um, the, the ability to brand is much more superior in the U.S. The only reason you'd go offshore is honestly price, but let's not discount price and never discount price in the mind of your buyer either. Mark, did you have any thoughts? I think also from a sourcing perspective, this is where I think a lot of companies fall down in this process, in my opinion, my experience. When you take a product and let's say you're transitioning, I think somebody mentioned, I think it was Dustin, right? You said something about uh, rigid plastics, uh, you know, like uh, tubs to, to pouches. That's a huge trend right now. 
where I think, and we get involved in that. In fact, we're helping customers go from tubs to big pouches. Where I think they fall down is they don't understand how long it's going to take. Okay, so if you if you go out and you source corrugated, um, which is another big topic for you all, right? You know that's eight ten weeks of the sourcing. You know eight weeks to transition. It's a box. You know you're in. You're done. Well, you're now talking about how things fill. You know you need to compare, have your suppliers all test their product. You, you could be literally looking at ten months. 12 months, eight months, depending on the type of SKUs and the complexity to do a full vetting of your suppliers. So the number one thing we I see, and I think we, the team sees as a failure is companies don't budget enough time. It cannot be done overnight. Number two, and this is the, the same thing I'm just gonna build on what James was saying. In, in this business, more than corrugated, in my opinion, in flexible films, your supplier is your partner, okay? Because you need to have a partnership level relationship with them. If you go into this and you think about it as a buyer that this is a transactional deal, I'll just you know buy six months worth of supply, one time shot. A, nobody's going to do business with you. B, the the opportunity and the complexity of transitioning is still there. So we we always advise when you're looking to go to flexibles, where you're looking to renegotiate or source flexibles, consider it like a partnership. Look at minimum three four year agreements so you can grow with your partner on this. So you get the combination of price, quality, service, and all those things. So those are two of the things that I see. Not, not enough time focused on it. And then uh, some people will still think of it as very transactional in their buying as opposed to partnership-based. So we've got about uh, seven minutes left, and we've got some questions coming in about recycling flexible packaging. So I want to make sure that we, we answer uh, these questions also. So I know one of the things I hear a lot is that it's really, really hard to recyclable flex, recycle flexible pou pouches. It's not the best sustainable option. So Terry, would love to get your take on recycling flexible packaging. And then here's Eduardo's specific question. Are you aware of any commercialized large scale recyclable film for pouches, in particular for a mono material solution for wet slash liquid products? Sure. <clears throat> um, well, I'll start with answering Eduardo's question, or at least trying to. Um, there, there's an application that I am aware of. It's, it's again. I, I go back to a baby food pouch, the the Nestle Gerber. Uh, it, it's not been fully converted into the market, but there are commercial packages that are now out there. Um, the other application is bag and box. Now it's you call it semi-rigid, but both the corrugate and the inside bag material and the fitment that you would see in a wine package, that is recyclable. Uh, and the suppliers and now the brand owners are, are touting that as a recyclable package. Um, <clears throat> overall, with respect to recycling of flexible packaging, I think we've all touched on it in different aspects. Uh, I would say that uh, the, the, the co-mingled materials, be it foil, nylon, and other polymers, uh, technically, they are recycled, and there's just no infrastructure today in terms of post-use collection, uh, sorting, and, and the process within these uh, waste management companies to, to do that. So, you know, we, we use an outside company that they take 100% of our, of our waste and scrap internally, uh, which does include all of those commingled materials. And they combust it, and they are now making um, Secondary packaging for, you know, be it box, uh, box supports, things of that nature. So it is being done. There's obviously the uh, companies that do collect materials and do the same thing into other re reusable type of, uh, of materials. The, you know, the, the, you know, we still got to do a, a better job of, educating 
the industry and really communicating the whole LCA uh, and because the data is very compelling in terms of if you're truly concerned about the environmental impact uh, of, of our environment, certainly from a, uh, it, it uses fewer resources, requires significantly less energy, emits significantly less greenhouse gas, and less waste that goes into landfill. Dustin, closing thoughts from you on the sustainability aspect of flexible packaging. That's a, that's a loaded gun question and, and uh, two minutes to answer it. So I'm not gonna take the full two minutes because everybody's gonna get up. I'll, I'll leave it and keep it very short, sweet and simple. We have to design for the future. We have to work together. Um, this really is dependent on collaboration across the supply chain. It, it begins with raw material producers, moves on to manufacturers like Tim and myself, Terry as well, um, consumers, and then the brands, right? Everybody along the supply chain needs to work together in order for us to design an infrastructure that's gonna support the future state that we all wanna be in. Yes, well stated. So with that, if, Terry, do you wanna, one more comment? No, I was just agreeing with Dustin's comment, <laughs> shaking my head. <laughs> Yeah, per perfect way to uh, to to close out our, our discussion today. Um, so wanted to thank all of our panelists, James, Terry, Tim, Mark, and Dustin for sharing your insights about flexible packaging. If you found our discussion valuable, join us again on July 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern to discuss packaging for the cannabis industry. And I encourage you to follow all of us on LinkedIn, reach out to any of the speakers here today. We're all very big on knowledge sharing and networking and communication and, and community building. So please, please don't be shy and we'd be happy to connect. With that, enjoy your afternoons and we will see you back on our show next month. Good seeing you. Nice to meet you, Terry. Yeah.